Come on in, guys. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about the Survivor players screwed the hardest by twists. Survivor, through its history, has kept players on their toes by introducing elements in the game that the players simply couldn't have foreseen. And that began all the way back in Season 3, when the tribes were swapped for the first time ever, in what most consider to be the very first twist in Survivor history, which, yeah, is gonna be on here. And ever since, Survivor's been on a mission to completely screw over players simply for playing the game in ways numerous, cruel, and sometimes even hilarious. And I'm not even going to count advantages on this list, like the Immunity Idol, or Idol Nullifier, or Idol Nullifier Nullifier, which I'm sure is coming someday. Because that could fill up a whole other video. Turns out, Survivor does a lot of screwing. So for now, I'll only be counting players screwed over by mechanics in the game itself, most of whom couldn't have done a single thing to save themselves. That all said, let's count down the 10 players Survivor screwed the hardest. The 10th most screwed player is Ozzy in Survivor Cook Islands, completely boned by Survivor's first ever Final 3. I don't have to tell you that for the first 12 seasons of Survivor, Survivor had a final two and a seven member jury. But all that changed after Terry Dietz was taken out at Exile Island's final three. In fact, this had been a pattern pretty much since the show began. Quite often, the fan favorite went out in third, leading to a not as exciting final two. And Terry losing was seemingly the final straw for production, which plus sized the final two right into a final three in the following season. Only they didn't tell the players, and the I24 were going along through the merge, picking off Raro one by one under the assumption that, yeah, there was gonna be a final two. They only learned that there's going to be a final three on their way to the final four immunity challenge, which is revealed to be the final immunity challenge. Had this been a final two as usual, it's entirely likely that Ozzy wins whatever final three challenge they had, given that he'd won every single immunity challenge at the merge except for one, and was up to this point and probably still is the most physically dominant player in Survivor history. Were that the case, he probably takes Becky to the final two and wins handily, leaving Yule out as our final three robbed goddess. But as we all know, Yule eked out a win against Ozzy by a single vote in the first ever Final 3, and ironically, the attempt by production to fix the finale for the fan favorite to win blew up in their faces literally instantly. At number 9 is Suri in Survivor Micronesia, screwed over by Survivor's random switch back to a Final 2. So it's been three seasons since Survivor switched to Final 3s, and most of the players understand that to be the new norm. And there was no reason to think otherwise heading into the endgame of Survivor Micronesia. After all the precedent was set, the jury began at Final 10, meaning a logical Final 3 and Jury of 7. And at Final 3, Suri, Amanda, and Parvati have all accomplished what they set out to do from the merge, make the Final 3 together. Only, yeah, they made the Final 3, but not the Final 3. Survivors suddenly decided to go back to Final 2s, and the three Black Widows are told that they have one more immunity challenge left, which is historically not Suri's strong suit. Just like Ozzy before her, Suri is completely screwed over by not having the knowledge of how many players would be facing the jury, which seems pretty darn important when you're, you know, planning your endgame. At number 8 is Candace in Blood vs. Water, screwed over by a day one vote that unfairly sent her to Redemption Island literal minutes into the game. In Blood vs. Water, each tribe was forced to vote someone out of their tribe before they even hit their beach, in a first impressions vote. And Candace was voted out of Galang, receiving six of her tribe's votes. A day one vote is never fair, but this was particularly unfair for Candace because her and her husband John were last minute additions to the cast, replacing RC from Survivor Philippines and her father, who were unable to compete at the last second. So with an open slot, Survivor called their favorite all-star seat filler Candace. 
The problem for Candace coming in at the last second was that all the other returnees on the season had pre-gamed super hard, meaning that since she was last in, she was going to be first out, especially when the first vote takes place 45 seconds into the season. Given all the pre-gaming, it's possible she might have been out first anyway, but she stood no chance without getting to work her way into the dynamics of the tribe. Compounding Candace's misery, she was sent to live on Redemption Island with Rupert, who swapped places with his wife Laura when she was also voted out on day one. Never in a million years would I have guessed I would be in this position on second day. Me neither. Truly a fate worse than death. The seventh most twist-screwed players in Survivor history are Chrissy, Devin, and Ryan in Survivor Heroes vs. Healers vs. Hustlers, screwed over by a surprise Final Four fire-making challenge. Final Four fire-making has weaved its way into the fabric of Survivor by now, but in Season 35, this came completely out of left field. Ben was public enemy number one in Triple H for most of the merge, but made his way to Final Four with gratuitous idle play, after idle play, after idle play. But he was all idled out at Final Four, and when he lost final immunity, his number was up. But Chrissy, as the Final Four immunity winner, is given a last second game advantage, an ability to take one person to Final Three, and to pit the other two against each other in a fire-making challenge. Uh, can she like not use this? I don't mind Final Four fire making as much as some of you do, so long as the players know about it beforehand, but I particularly dislike its inaugural entry, as I think it robbed us of what would have been the first Final Three in forever, in which each player legitimately had a shot to win the jury votes, and which probably would have come down to Chrissy, Devin, and Ryan's individual performances in the final Tribal Council. Instead, Ben steamrolled his way to an easy win. At number six, we have Xi'an, whose game was destroyed courtesy of a fake merge twist in Survivor Thailand. Again, a twist that preys on the Survivor's assumptions about what's going to happen, only to pull the rug out from under them. During Thailand, Xi'an was consistently on the outs of the Sukjai power structure, managing to make it to final 10 by the skin of her teeth. And when Jeff told the tribes that they'd be living on the same beach, it was a reasonable assumption that they'd be, you know, merged. And pretty much as soon as everyone's together on the same island, she ends flipping to Chewy Gone, ready to vote poor Penny out. Uh, did you figure out what you're gonna do? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go with my, uh... I think I'm gonna go... As they gather for what they think is their first individual immunity challenge, Jeff pulls out the biggest gotcha in Survivor history, smugly letting them know that despite living on the same beach, having a merged tribe name and a painted flag, there's still two tribes and will compete as such in the next immunity challenge. And after Sukjai lost immunity, Xi'an was an easy consensus boot. Talk about a technicality. The fifth most screwed player in Survivor history is Jenny, screwed by Survivor's first and only bottle twist in Survivor Cook Island. After Raro loses the final 11 immunity challenge, they're given a mysterious bottle to be opened after they vote at Tribal Council. Rebecca's the easy consensus boot for Raro in this spot, and everyone assumed that the note in the bottle would be announcing they merge at final 10. But instead, the note says that they're to vote out another player right then and there. This is just super unfair to Jenny, who really had no time to make her case or plead her loyalty to the rest of her tribe mates. She's voted out over Jonathan under the assumption that she'll flip at the merge, even though Jonathan had already mutinied once and actually did flip at the merge. And even though I love me some Penner, we were robbed of more cold-blooded parchment art from Jenny. Let's, uh, let's calm it down there, Jenny. At number four is Silas, the first victim of the first ever tribe swap in Survivor Africa. Silas was at the center of a generational power struggle on Samburu, which the four youngins won thanks to a survival quiz after a tie at their first tribal council. It was riveting. True or false, smoke from burning elephant dung will keep mosquitoes at bay. 
Anyway, Silas in particular is super cocky once he has the tribal numbers, but at final 12, the tribes are swapped and cosmic justice is done. When Silas is swapped to Boran with Frank and T-Bird, the two remaining older players from Samburu and none of his former allies. It's a foregone conclusion on new Boran that Silas is toast, and he is indeed sent home unanimously. Now, to be fair, Silas undoubtedly did this to himself. At best, he was getting 10th, assuming in his best interest a merge at 5-5, which would have had T-Bird or Frank, whoever was left, flipping at final 10 instead of final 12. But still, Silas had no way of knowing that his downfall would come even earlier, courtesy of a tribe swap that led to one of the most satisfying pre-merge downfalls in history. It seems quaint now to call a simple tribe swap a huge twist, but at the time this was huge news and a lot of people thought this was really unfair, but it was all worth it to see that smirk get wiped right off his face. The third most twist-screwed players in Survivor history are Wanda and Jonathan in Survivor Palau, sent home in what I believe to be one of the meanest things Survivor has ever done. In Palau, the 20 contestants were on the same beach for the first two days of the game, not sorted into tribes and generally unsure of what was even going on. On the second day, Jeff visited their camp and told the survivors that tribes would be selected via schoolyard pick, and two people, who went through the grueling casting process, left their lives, families, and jobs for over a month, flew across the world and spent a week doing press, wouldn't be selected, and would just leave. On the one hand, like Silas, you can argue that Wanda and Jonathan did this to themselves. After all, Wanda was obnoxious and Jonathan was kind of a loner. But I really don't think players should ever get eliminated without at least getting the chance to plead their case at Tribal Council. But the Survivor Gods disagree, and Jonathan and Wanda weren't chosen in the schoolyard pick and were unceremoniously sent away in a boat. At number two is Aaron in Survivor China, sent home in the swap screw to end all swap screws. At the final 12 of Survivor China, Fei Long and Zhang Hu got notes that said to pick the two strongest members of the opposing tribe to add to your tribe. They swapped tribe mates, with Zhang Hu taking Aaron and James, and Fei Long taking Sharia and Frosty, the worst trade deal this side of GameStop. And all of a sudden, Aaron goes from on top of Fei Long to on bottom of Zhang Hu. All because the note was worded in a way that ensured physically strong people would be swapped to a minority position on the other tribe. And this particularly hurt Aaron, who from the outside appears to be the clear leader of Fei Long. He really didn't stand a chance, as PG and Jamie even threw the next immunity challenge to get rid of him, to protect Sharia and Frosty on the other tribe, and to weaken Fei Long by cutting off its head. My brain hurts. I generally think swaps are fair game, and plenty of players have survived a bad swap draw, but the way this one was phrased and carried out all but ensured the swappy would be eliminated. The most twist-screwed player in Survivor history is Michelle in Survivor Fiji. Here we have a player who I genuinely think was playing a great game, potentially even a winning game, but was taken out by twists that just compounded against her until it was impossible for her to survive. Michelle was in good with power players Earl and Yao Man, and entered the merge in the middle of the power structure of a strong majority alliance without a single vote cast against her thus far. Literally everything is going her way in the game, until Jeff reveals that the final 10 will be randomly divided into two groups of five who will compete against each other for immunity, and Michelle gets dealt one of the worst hands ever, ending up in a group of five consisting of herself, three of the four people on the opposing alliance, and Stacy, who is probably her weakest ally in the majority alliance. Once this group loses, the fun just keeps on coming when it's revealed that they won't even get to strategize, they just have to go straight to Tribal Council. You will not be going back to camp. There will be no time to strategize. We're heading to Tribal Council right now. This is just so frustrating because I feel like with a little time, Michelle could weasel out of this one. But instead, she and Stacy pretty much have to vote against each other and hope Alex, Mookie, and Dreams vote for the other person. Mookie ends up actually voting with Michelle, but Alex, sniffing out the opportunity to take out a power player, signals to Dreams at Tribal to vote for Michelle, and along with Stacy's vote, that's enough to take her out. 
You really got a feel for someone whose game went from pretty much perfect to down the drain in the space of a single afternoon. I'm still mad 13 years later. Got nothing else for ya. To help me avoid getting screwed by the YouTube algorithm, like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.